are in the book of John, and I'm in chapter 20. If you want to turn your Bibles there, that's where we're going to be this morning. And again, I want to uh, just to express my appreciation also to our worship band, who sounded fantastic this morning. It's great to sing together. Let's give them a round of applause again. I want to start this morning by saying something I think is just truth about today and our culture. Skepticism is alive and well in America today. And skeptics are pretty much skeptical about everything. We're skeptical about government and politicians. We're skeptical about journalism, police. We're skeptical about just about everybody in authority. And it was in February, I ran across a study that was done by the Pew Research Group, and they did a very large poll in America and found out what is Americans really believing in, what do we have doubts about, and what they discovered is we pretty much have doubts about everybody and everything. And like, for instance, uh, TV news, you know, once upon a time, Walter Cronkite, Dan Rather, Peter Jennings, they were kind of gold. I mean, what they said, we believed no more. There is not a single news agency that any of us have much faith in. We have a lot of doubt. I will tell you, guys like me, once upon a time, there was a high level of faith or belief in pastors as individuals that you could trust in society. No more. That's, that's, that's gone. Don't even get me started on, again, Congress. They got the lowest score of all. Everybody said, we do not believe those guys at all. If their mouths are moving, they're lying. I mean, that's kind of basically where it is. Now, I'm here to tell you there was one surprise in the study, and it was a little bit of a head scratcher. I still find it a little bit odd, but there was one group of people that Americans predominantly had a lot of faith in. They were not very skeptical of all, and I really would love to ask some questions about this, but here's the category. It's small business owners. I, I don't know why. I just didn't see that one coming. It's like, little Bipsy, you have our faith in Edmonds. We love you. You know, Red Twig, we love you. Starbucks, not so much. But faith, Red Twig, we got you. And so, again, we have this tremendous belief right now in small businesses for whatever reason. But predominantly, skepticism just seems to be the default position of today. Americans as a society have elevated doubt to an unquestioned virtue. And so anytime somebody is expressing a level of doubt, especially that's an ongoing doubt, we, you know, we tend to applaud that. We're like, yeah, that's right. And if anybody has a level of certainty about something, then, mm, boy, we look a little askance at that. And so anybody that has a, a firmer belief, we are not, we're not giving much credit to d- these days. Doubt and skepticism are alive and well in our world, perhaps more than ever before. And today's story revolves around doubt and the opposite of doubt, which is belief or, or faith. And so both of those are at opposite ends of a pole, and that's what today's story is all about. I want to introduce you to one of the characters of our story today, and his name is, and this is what he's been known for for many millennia, Doubting Thomas. That, that's who we're going to be talking about today, Doubting Thomas. And uh, he is going to have some interactions with Jesus that are going to be very interesting for us. I learned something about Doubting Thomas a number of years ago, and I would like to share that with you. Uh, Denise and I, many of you know this, it's been almost six years ago now that we, for our very first time, were in Rome. And one of the things that we did while we were in Rome is we went and saw a lot of the beautiful cathedrals there. And one of the things that you need to understand about Catholicism in order to be able to understand if you're going to go to a place like Italy or Spain, that they have these very, very large cathedral churches and in fact, if you're a large enough church, that's what you're known as. You're known as a cathedral. You're, you're big, you're grand. But there's a step above a cathedral, and the step above the cathedral is the basilica. But in order to become a basilica, you need one key thing that must be resident at your cathedral in order to be elevated to the grand level of basilica, and it is a relic. It's an actual piece of Christian history that is on display for all to see. Let me give you an example. Many of you have been to St. Peter's Basilica. Why is it a basilica? Because Peter was buried there. So that's the relic is this body of Peter. 
Now, we found out that there were several spots where there were basilicas, and we're like, hey, we're going to go check this out. So one of our favorite basilicas is right here. This is the one. It's called the Basilica of the Holy Cross. And I mean, that's the entrance on the way in. I mean, just look at it. I mean, it's just grand, and, and there's tapestry, and there's, there's frescoes, and there's gold, and there's all these things that are just telling a story there. And the story that's being told in this one is actually about Constantine, the first emperor that's a Christian emperor in Rome. He's got a mother who uh, is really into relics and really into uh, Christian history. So this is 325 AD. She goes back to Jerusalem, and she gets all of these relics, these things that are mementos of the faith from the day, and she pulls them back into Rome in order to be on display in order for everybody to be able to appreciate. So, you know, I did a little reading, and I'm like, okay, I, I want to go see what the relic is here. And so uh, we took a little spot. It's right the door to the left, and we go down. We go down, down, down the stairwell. There's Denise walking down the stairwell, and you can see we're going to walk into a room. It's not a very big room. We walk into that room, and one of the things that we notice is that there's a piece of glass there. Here's what you see. The glass is on the left-hand side. And we're like, okay, what have, we, what have we got here? And we're like, okay, there's a piece of wood there that they say is part of the wooden cross. I, I don't know about that, but there it is. And we see a, there, there was a, a thorn that was reportedly off the crown of Jesus. And we see that there. And then we see it all the way in the upper left-hand corner. And you see it on this pedestal right here up close so you can get a good view of it. And for all to see is the index finger of doubting Thomas. That's what it is. And I'm like, I think that's my favorite relic of all time. I, I love this. I mean, you just can't make this stuff up. This is awesome. I have no idea if that's really the finger of doubting Thomas, but it tickled me so much. And I, 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 Denise and I were like, there is nobody here. I mean, we are the only ones standing in this room. The, the cathedral was pretty much, or the basilica rather, was pretty much just empty. And we're like, why isn't everybody just beating down the door to see Dowdy Thomas's index finger? <laughs> How would you like one of your biggest gaffes of all time to be on public display for everybody to see? Here's Doubting Thomas's finger. Remember how much he doubted. Here's Ernie's ear. Remember, he never listened to God. Here's Tom's tongue. It's still sharp as a knife. Here's Nancy's nose. She put her nose in all kinds of people's business. That's what it's like with doubting Thomas is that he is on exhibit for all to see. Before we unpack this story today, I need to give you a little bit of background because I want to make sure you're tracking. The kids said it real fast, so I want to make sure you're tracking with where we are. This is Resurrection Sunday at church. We're celebrating a resurrected Jesus. Amen? Yeah. And, and, and here's what is the story that's told in the Bible. Jesus dies, and he rises again. The ladies go to the tomb, and he's not there. They even have an angel that confirms to them, nope, you're looking for somebody that's risen. He's not here. So the ladies go running back, they get the guys, and they go, you're not going to believe it, but Jesus is not in the tomb. James and uh, John make their way, or Peter and John make their way all the way back. They run as fast as they can back to the tomb, and they go, whoa, we cannot believe this. And so they're just reeling with this news. They end up going back to a home where they're staying. And by the way, they're still pretty frightened because they don't know what the Romans' authority are necessarily going to do, what's going to transpire in the society now that Jesus has been crucified. And so they're just kind of taking this all in, and lo and behold, Jesus shows up, boom, and he's in his resurrected body. And it's as, you know, they say they've got locked doors, and Jesus just seems to go through the door somehow, through the wall somehow, and he appears and says, peace be with you. Now, here's what you need to know in order to make the story really work today. Doubting Thomas was not there, all right, Thomas, he's not there. I don't know where Thomas was. The Bible doesn't say. Had he gone to the market? Needed a latte or something? I mean, what, what's, you know, what's Thomas doing? Was it a bathroom break? Did he you know, need a long walk to clear his head? We don't know. But what we do know is Thomas is not there. So all the disciples say, you're not going to believe it. Jesus came and appeared to us. And Thomas is not one who's at that spot 
And so today, our story is going to be about the interaction with Thomas, first of all with the disciples and then with Jesus. And Doubting Thomas might also be called Skeptical Thomas, and he has a lot to teach us. In fact, more than you might imagine. In fact, he's more like us than you might imagine. Here's what I want to answer today for us. How does Jesus treat skeptical, doubting Thomas? And how does Jesus treat us if we are individuals that have some level of skepticism or doubt? That's what today's passage is all about. And so let's explore what's written here for us. First, Jesus takes skeptics right where they are. That's the first thing I want you to hear today. Jesus takes skeptics right where they are. And he took Thomas right where he was. Thomas says in verse 25, if you'll give me that passage, he says, unless I see the nail marks in the hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hands in the side, I will not believe. And so he tells all the disciples, okay, that you saw Jesus alive, but I'm sorry, I'm going to have to see it for myself. I'm even going to have to touch it for myself before I am able to believe. And, you know, at this point, he's emotional. He's been through so much. You can kind of understand why he would say, I'm going to need something a little bit more. I want you to notice something. Thomas is not immediately condemned. In fact, we can get that idea sometimes, that if we show the least little bit of doubt, the least little bit of skepticism, especially as it relates to kind of religious things, that we're, you know, we're on the outs, that God's going to condemn that. That's not the case. Thomas is an individual in the scriptures who is an individual who has a, a level of doubt. Now, I want you to also see something about Thomas, and it's also true about us. He's not a one-dimensional kind of guy. So it's not true that Thomas always doubted everything. He doubted at this one episode. There's no doubt about that, and that's why he gets his nickname. But that's not him forever. In fact, he is first mentioned earlier in this gospel, John chapter 11, and Jesus is getting ready to go back to Judea. He's way up north. He's getting ready to go back to this spot. And the disciples know, ooh, man, that's a dangerous spot. The last time we were there, people were not happy with Jesus. And so they say, oh, Jesus, you sure you want to go back to Judea? I'm not sure if, if that's a good idea. And Jesus says, that's where we're going. Thomas says this. He says, let us then go and die with you. Thomas is an individual that's actually willing to give his life for Jesus. He's followed Jesus for three years. He's seen all kinds of things. That does not sound like a guy to me who's just filled with all kinds of doubt. Here's what I want you to hear again. He is like us. There are moments in which he is clarion. There's moments in which he's got virtue. And there's moments in which he falls and goes, mm, I'm not sure. I'm going to need a little bit more. There are times when he doubted, and there are times when we doubt too. I, I love this quote by Emma Scrivener. She's an author, a writer, a speaker, and this is what she says. Sometimes I sin, and sometimes I doubt. <laughs> Neither is good in themselves, but they're not surprising or unexpected. A doubtless Christian is as impossible as a sinless Christian. And what a great reminder for all of us. There are going to be times in our lives when we do not understand, and we're going to be asking questions about that instance. There are going to be times in which we sin, we repent, we get back up, we walk again, and that is all what it means to lead this Christian life. Doubt is part of being human. <laughs> there are times in which I doubt. I doubt my intelligence. I doubt my friends. I doubt my health. I doubt my athleticism. I doubt my writing. There are times in which I doubt things about my own life. Therefore, it would be very odd if we didn't also doubt God at times. In fact, millions of people have wondered things like, does God exist? Is God all-powerful? Does God hear and answer prayer? Does God really care about me? And here's what I want you to hear. God is not afraid of tough questions. He says, ask away, engage, I want you to. In fact, honest questions are what's needed to have robust faith. If you're not asking some questions, you cannot grow in your faith. Jesus is willing to meet the skeptic right where they are. And if that's you today, Jesus is not repulsed by that at all. In fact, he's going to meet you where you are 
and take you from that spot. Hopefully somewhere, right, if you're willing to go. But he's saying, I'm going to meet you right where you are. All right, the second way that Jesus treats skeptics is he does not follow our schedules. <laughs> I want you to notice something. Thomas makes the request. I've got to see the nail, the nail-scarred hands. I've got to show me, the, show me those. And the answer is, not right now. Jesus does not appear out of thin air again in order to show Thomas. In fact, he makes him wait eight days. He does not come immediately. And that's true for all of us. We have questions. We have skepticism at times. And you know what? We ask the question, and God rarely shows up and resolves that immediately on the spot. We have a time where we have to wait, where we have to do some soul struggling, where we have to actually recognize our need. There's something forming in us while that waiting process is in order. Let me, let me tell you about some people that I've met. I've met some people who've been through some pretty tough trauma in their lives. Among the top of the list might be somebody who has a parent that maybe died when they were young. That's a, that's a tremendous loss in life. I've known some people who have had their father that's at a very young age walked out on their entire family, abandoned them, never saw them again. And that, that's a trauma that's a, that's a deep one. I mean, that's not easily just overcome. But here's what I've also noticed. I've noticed that over time, God tends to enter those individuals' lives, if they'll allow, and he ends up somehow consoling. I'm not saying he puts a bow on all that, that he makes it as if it never happened. No, 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 no. It's still very real. That pain is very real. But somehow, God has met individuals in the midst of that, and usually it's not like that. It's over the course of many years and many questions and many struggles. God is not on our timeline, and that's uh, it's frustrating for us at times, but that's what we need to understand is we can't make God do anything. We can ask, we can seek, we can bring that question back to him again, but we are going to be on his timeline, not he on ours. All right, there's something more that he does with skeptics. Third, when God is interacting, interacting with skeptics, he gives them enough. In Thomas's case, he actually gives him exactly what he wanted. Jesus shows up and decides to fulfill the request, and he says, Thomas, I'm going to actually let you put your finger inside those nail holes. I'm going to actually let you put your hand into my side. I love a painting. I will always love this painting. It's a master of uh, an Italian descent. His name is Caravaggio, and this is Caravaggio's image of Thomas who's meeting Jesus. And you'll notice that he's putting his finger inside the, the, the side of Jesus that was speared by the Romans right there. It was a, a gash in his side. And Thomas is now investigating for himself. And he's putting his finger in that hole. I want you to feel something for a minute. This is just an aside for me as I looked at the painting this week. Why does Jesus have a resurrected body that still has scars on it? You, you'd think, I would think, it's like, Jesus has got a perfect body. It's all healed up. And, you know, I mean, he'd be perfect. But for whatever reason, God says, no, I'm going to leave those scars on his body. And we also find out in the book of Revelation that Jesus, when he appears, he looks like a lamb that's been slain. You get that? He looks like a lamb that's had his neck slashed. And so he still carries those wounds. He carries those scars. And this is what allows Thomas to actually do his investigation. Thomas got resolution. He says, I now see and I believe. And he makes one of the clearest confessions of all of, of all the disciples because he says, you know, now you are my Lord and my God. And he's affirming two things that are important there. You're the one that's powerful, my Lord. You're the one who's over all of life and you've got control of life, but you're also my God. And it's a sign of him saying, I realize and I affirm that you are divine yourself, your deity. He's basically saying, I'm all in. Jesus gives us enough. If we have bad theology, then we would say that God must answer everything you ever ask for. And that's just not true because God's not a genie. But there are many times that God 
well, he says, you've asked for something, and finally, I'm not going to give it. He says that many times in the, in the scriptures, in the gospels, people are saying, give us another miracle. And he goes, no, you're not getting that. And it's as if he sees the heart, and he knows when the heart is really intent on good, and when the heart is not. And if it's just, you want to be dazzled, I'm not going to do that. But there's so many times in which he is going to give us what we need in order to follow him. I want you to see this because this is the upshot. This is really the important verse of the entire passage. And it's his words to Thomas. Thomas has said, you're my, you're my, you're my master and my God. And he makes this big affirmation. And Jesus says to him, have you believed because you've seen me? He says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And he's telling Thomas something. He's saying, Thomas, there are going to be a lot of people that would love to be where you're standing right now. They, they would love to be with me. They love to put their fingers inside those holes. But Thomas, they're going to be blessed because they're going to believe without seeing that. They're going to believe even though they don't have the evidence that you have. God is going to give them the word that's written in the Bible, and that's going to be enough for them. God's going to give them the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's going to be enough for them. God's going to give them the presence of the church, which is the representation on earth of his body. That's going to be enough for them. And so people are going to ask for all kinds of things, but he's going to give enough so that they can have faith and that they can have belief in Jesus. I want to ask you a question right now. I want to know how many believe that I have a $20 bill in my hand. Raise your hand if you think I have a $20 bill in my hand. Anybody? There's a, a couple. There's a couple. There's a couple. All right. All right. Lynette, I saw your hand go up. Right now, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to destroy your faith. I know that sounds really strident. But I'm going to do that because I'm going to show you that I do. I do have a $20 bill in my hand. Now, why did I say that? Because now you see the $20 bill. And you don't have to have faith anymore because knowledge is here. The reality is here. Before that, you had faith. And I don't know what you based that upon, but you probably said, well, if the past, Jesus did, that's a good answer. <laughs> but you, for whatever reason, said, I, I've got faith that that's going on. And maybe some of you did too, but you're just afraid to raise your hand. That's what I want you to hear today. Faith is needed when we don't have a complete picture. We've got some promises given to us. We've got some things that are good evidence that's leading in the direction, but you don't need faith if you see it all, if it's all revealed. That's what Paul even says. He goes, now we see in this glass dimly lit. We see in a mirror that's dim. We can't quite see through it, but the day is going to come when we're going to be in his presence and it's all going to be revealed. And at that moment, you won't need faith like you need right now. God is given enough. He's given enough evidence. He's given enough truth. He's given enough of the things that would lead us to be people that would say, yes, I want to be a person of faith. And I want to have faith specifically in this person of Jesus. I, I want you to see that kids didn't read it. But I want you to see how this story ends today. Because the way John wraps this up, I think is really cool. This is what John wraps up with. He says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, you know what? I can fill books, long tomes, of all the ways that Jesus showed up with the disciples and with the world and did amazing things. I could fill like lots of libraries with that. 
but I've given you what happened and what's needed in a kind of a condensed form. And I've given enough. I've given enough so that you would be a person that would come to believe in Jesus and that in so doing, he says it right there, you would have life in his name. You'd be somebody who God says, I'm pleased to call you a son or daughter and now I wish to do a work on the inside of you that you could never do yourself. I'm going to change you to look like my son. If you're already a follower of Jesus today, then you're grateful for doubting Thomas. But hear this, he's not just doubting Thomas, he's actually believing Thomas. That's where he ends up. And this experience is helpful to all of us because it helps all of us have some level of doubt, but keep fully investigating to the spot where we can be individuals who are believing Thomas, not just doubting Thomas. And if that's you today, there's some level of skepticism you have about Jesus or the scriptures, then identify it. Be honest about what that doubt is and come ready to engage in that. I love Tim Keller. Tim Keller is one of my heroes of the faith. I think we lost a great man of God a number of years ago, I think two years ago when he died. And he's just a clear writer. I, I just, everything about him, he's humble. I love that about him. And Tim Keller helps me to get a handle on what he's talking about when he says doubt. And Tim Keller says, there is a difference between dishonest doubt and honest doubt. Listen as Tim Keller makes that distinction for us. This is important for us today. The dishonest doubter is actually rather lazy. He doesn't respond to God's revelation by examining the claims. He's closed-minded, refusing to consider the possibility that something exists which could challenge his comprehension. He simply shrugs off the new claims with a flippant, that's impossible, or that's dumb. And he never really engages. That's the dishonest doubter. The honest doubter, on the other hand, is going to ask genuine questions. And this actually means that it's pretty risky. Because if you ask a real question, you might possibly get an answer that you don't expect, or worse, that you don't like. Real questions put the doubter in a posture of humility and vulnerability. She has to admit that there might be more out there than she knows. What if God actually answers? And what if his answer shatters some of my categories? What if the answer demands more from me than I really think I'm able to give? It takes guts to ask honest questions that you really want answers to. Can you be today an honest doubter? Somebody who says, I don't completely understand, but I'm open to learn, and that's honest doubt. That's where doubting Thomas was. He was an honest doubter. He was ready to change when presented with the evidence. This is the message of Easter, that God loves us. He loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus into the world to go to the cross. That was the specific reason that he came, was destiny was to be on a cross the Bible says that sin is actually rebellion against God. Rebellion. It's saying, I know better. I know better the way life should go. I know better the way my life should go. I know better. I have wisdom more than you do, God. And, you know, I hear what you want over there, but you know what? My way's better. When we repent, we're individuals who are saying, you know what? I'm not sure I believe that anymore. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. When we repent, we're saying, I think I thought too little of God and too much of myself. That, that's what it really means to repent. It's like, I put God, I, I, I disbelieved God, but I also, you know, I trashed God. I, I, I didn't believe his reputation at all. I tore him down. And now I'm an individual that says, you know what? I think I'm to the spot of believing. I thought too little of him and too much of me. And that's why I want to have change. God is ready at that moment to enter in and to enact the change in our lives. That's our moment of revelation. Jesus came to die in order that we might be forgiven, that we might be given the Holy Spirit and have a new life breathed on the inside of us. We trust Jesus by simply placing our faith in him, by saying, I'm taking you at your word, I'm going to follow you, I'm going to listen to your words, especially as it's described in the scriptures, and I'm going to emulate you. That's what I'm going to attempt to do. That's what it means to trust Christ. 
is to say, I want that shift in my life to that spot. So I'm asking you today, is that where you are? Doubting Thomas becomes believing Thomas. Thomas's doubts first led to a total belief later. How about you? Is your story of doubt ultimately leading you to a story of faith? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the story of Thomas. That's recorded in the scriptures for us to see that moment of his gaffe that we now have retold again and again and again for the benefit of the church, for the benefit of the world. And I thank you, Lord, that you are not afraid of tough questions. You are not afraid of individuals who say, I don't understand that. And you enter in with that and do great stuff with that if we'll just be honest about it and pursue the answers. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you that you have done so much to demonstrate your trustworthiness. And today, we want to celebrate you. I think specifically of individuals here today who maybe for the very first time have said, wow, I'm not sure I knew that's why Jesus came, was to die for me. And I'm praying, Lord, that those individuals would have the courage today to take a step forward. Maybe it's trusting you fully, but maybe it's saying, I want to learn more. I want to be there. I want to be an honest doubter. And I pray, Lord, that you would fulfill your calling inside each of them. Woo them. Draw them. Be the truth that you say that you are to them. We love you. We celebrate your resurrection today. We do this in Christ's name.